us to make salvation possible for us, that you laid down your life and you held nothing back. And tonight, we just want to be people whose ears are open and our eyes are fixed on you, that as Joe preaches your word, that the word would be planted on fertile soil and that it would produce much fruit in our life so that we might live a life that brings glory to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife is so talented. <laughs> oh, you know, it's not about talent. It's about worshiping the Lord, and that's what we're here tonight to do. And here comes Sherry, the vacation partner of Lori. And this is all personal information that people listening on the live stream probably don't even know about, but we're having fun here tonight. And I thought my grandson did a pretty good job of watching my youngest granddaughter out here in the hallway to do. So anyway, it's a big night for me on this Father's Day, as you can imagine. And to you fathers as well, absolutely. I almost got my youngest granddaughter to talk me into bringing a frog tonight, Sherry. Uh, oh, there she's saying, no, I can't have that frog. Uh, and you'll remember what the acrostic is that we used for frog for Jeremiah, faithfully relying on God. <laughs> is that right? F-R-O-G. So we're in Jeremiah, and uh, it's a great book, but it is intense reading. And we're in chapter 26. And we will be going through, as uh, Cyrus, who's team teaching this with me, Cyrus Gill, um, says we're doing we're do like sports highlights. <laughs> this is a highlight reels. So we are not going into a deep exegesis of every single verse in these passages. For five chapters, you would hear me talking like a used car salesman or like an auctioneer. And I actually fall prey to that sometimes because all these verses are very inspirational. And thank you so much, brother. Appreciate it. And, uh, but we're starting in chapter 26 tonight, and I, I've got some fun little narration summaries of some of these texts for you, but I'm also going to fly in and, and land on a text or two in each chapter, and we'll spend a lot more time on chapter 29, just so you know where we're going tonight. But Jeremiah is faithfully relying on God, and that's, that's the main thing, keeping the main thing. So in chapter 26, you'll see that Jeremiah is threatened with death. That's the title that a lot of your English translations have over the top of that chapter. And here's the, the scriptures. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Jos Josiah, who was a good king, just about all the rest of them were bad, but Josiah was good. He died young. Uh, Josiah, the king of Judah, the word of the Lord, this word of the Lord, uh, came. This, thus says the Lord, stand in the court of the Lord's house, that's the temple, and speak to all the cities of Judah that come to worship in the house of the Lord, all the words that I am commanding you to speak. See why I want to read this passage, right? Because the Lord commands, you know, all these words you read. And they're doing so at the temple. Jeremiah is taking his stand there at the temple. Uh, read them to them and do not hold back a word. It may be that they will listen and everyone turn from his evil, his evil way, that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do them because of their evil deeds. But as you may remember from the introduction of the book of Jeremiah chapter 1, God does tell him they're not going to listen and this chapter is not an exception. But they're getting a little bit tired of Jeremiah now. They're no longer kind of intrigued and teasing and mocking. At this point, they are ready to kill him. So um, that, that joke I may have raised a couple weeks ago, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> uh, that's not always true. Sometimes people will always try to pay you back, and you don't want them to because you're just doing it as unto the Lord. But sometimes things that go around come around, and, and it's just the way it is. But um, a lot of times in doing God's work, um, it doesn't always come around. <laughs> 
We are in enemy-occupied territory, the world, the flesh, our old nature, and the devil are always prowling about uh, wanting to get after us. And you'll see in verse 7 it says that the priests, oh, they're the religious people, I'm sure they'll be open, and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah. You know, we live in America, so that's a government by the people and for the people and of the people. So if all the people could just hear it and understand it, they would certainly come around with the, the priests and the prophets. These words, they heard him saying these words in the house of the Lord. And then verse 8, And when Jeremiah had finished speaking, all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Well, we won't get into all the details of the chapter, but uh, it kind of reminds me of the life of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus taught in the temple? He said, You've made this house of prayer for all nations a den of robbers because they were selling animals, they were marking up the prices in the court of the Gentiles, which is the only place non-Jews could go to inquire of the Lord in prayer. And it was like a circus and an open-air market in there. And he drove the money changers out. And some people believe that that was that action that really was a catalyst for some of the religious leaders at that time really wanting to kill Jesus. There are some people that believe he may have actually cleansed this temple twice, once at the beginning of his ministry. That's where Gospel of John puts it in chapter 2, and once at the end. So if he did it once, that's one strike. And you know, you, We all know people that say three strikes and you're out. But, but if you do something like that in, in a religious establishment and you upset the governing authorities and you upset the cash flow, uh, two strikes is all you get and you're out. And a lot of times Jesus would do healings and it would be like they would try to grab him to kill him, but it wasn't his time. And it seemed like he was indestructible until it was his time. And then he says he lay down his own life. Nobody takes it from him and he'll raise it up as well. That's our Lord Jesus. Well, Jeremiah kind of has the same promise in a sense, lighter scale. God told him, they're going to come after you and I'm going to protect you. And this chapter is so interesting because after he, um, he does this prophesying and they want to kill him, um, they, they don't take action. They take the matter, the, the prophets and the priests and everybody, they take it to the king. And the king has got double-minded prophets. You know what I mean? The prophet's supposed to speak for God. Jeremiah does. But he's got these other prophets too. And they're going to speak for Yahweh, the God of creation, the God of the Bible, the God of the... Judeo-Christian uh, God revealed in Scripture, and um, but they can't agree with themselves. So one of the prophets in this chapter tells a story about this guy. He said, look, well, we can't kill Jeremiah because during the reign of Hezekiah, who was one of the few good kings uh, in Judah, uh, this prophet came and, uh, and Hezekiah listened to him. And, and they, uh, because he listened to him, God didn't let the army get him. You know, that was Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians. But then another prophet shows up, and uh, <clears throat> he gives another prophecy in the midst of this. Of this all happens in this, this chapter 26. And he gives a story about a prophet came before a king of Judah who was a wicked king and said that people should repent or judgment was coming. But this prophet had to run for his life because the people were going to kill him, and he fled the country and went to Egypt. But the wicked king of Judah sent spies to Egypt, found him out, brought him back to Judah, and that king slayed him right there, right there in front, took the law in his own, judge, jury, executioner, all in one. And so while they're talking about all this stuff, it seems the people get distracted or, or something, but it turns out Jeremiah doesn't have people wanting to kill him anymore. I don't know if it's because they just got so confused by all the mixed signals, but God kept his promise to protect his life and will do so again and again. It's a fabulously almost funny story except for the fact that it shows you how confused the times were that people would prophesy in the name of Yahweh, not Baal, and tell lies on his behalf. And God was not impressed uh, with that. So Jeremiah very courageously says the priests and the prophets and the political people um, with the king can do with him as they see fit. You'll see that in the chapter, which is very bold because they've already said they want to kill him. Do with me as you see fit. He's ready to die. But what is he doing when he says that? Is he having a fatalism and he's ready to go? 
Well, God's told him he's going to prophesy to kings multiple. And this is like the first king after Josiah. So that's like king number one. And, and so Jeremiah is resigned to death. He's already died to self. And so he's willing to die physically, but he's indestructible because he's in the center of God's will, and it's not the time. God is going to use him. He's given him certain promises that he's going to do. So he's faithfully and full, or fully, if you want, fully relying on God. Uh, so either because of God's direct intervention or the misdirection of the contradictory storytelling confused prophets and their moral lesson or lack of moral lesson, the unanimous opinion that Jeremiah should be executed on the spot is not carried out. End of chapter 27. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Okay, chapter, uh, I mean 26. So now we're into chapter 27. Jeremiah then tells King Zedekiah that he should willingly put on a yoke of bondage. Now, I don't know if you know what a yoke is. It's not a bad yoke. It's a bad yoke. It's not an egg yoke. It's a wooden thing that you put on the oxen's neck so they can plow, and they're kind of your slave animal, your, your domestic plower to help you plow the field. But uh, Jeremiah tells Zedekiah, you might as well willingly put on the yoke of bondage and serve Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, or he and all of his people will be met with great violence. And he goes further in this chapter to mention several other kings in the surrounding nations that they too should be willing to just put on the yoke, just put it on right now, and go into bondage uh, to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And it'll be better for you if you do. Um, but, of course, they don't uh, listen. Uh, and they have false prophets as well in these pagan nations that are telling them the news clips as well. And here's the news clips they're saying. Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar is a passing fad. They're not going to last long, and everything is going to be all right. And Jeremiah even tells the pagan nations that they too are being deceived by false prophets. I find that interesting because people sometimes will say to me, Joe, why do you talk about um, God's word as if it actually applies not just to my personal therapy, but actually to my environment, to my job situation, to education, to culture. Why in the world would you think that God thinks that way? Well, because our God is the God of the whole earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So Jeremiah, there in Judah, in Assyria, uh, Israel's already gone into captivity, uh, is telling pagan nations, look, for your own good, put on the yoke and go willingly with Nebuchadnezzar, or it's going to be very violent for you and they don't listen um, so they would have fared better if they did furthermore in this passage the false prophets in Judah were saying that the precious artifacts in the temple of the Lord uh, apparently had already been carried off to Babylon <laughs> and the false prophets are saying look those those furnishings made of gold the menorah you know the the ark of the covenant overlaid with gold and all that stuff Nebuchadnezzar is going to bring it back. You know, he's just borrowing it. You know, he, he just needed to look at it for a while. He's having a little art museum. Okay, I'm paraphrasing here. They don't really say that. But they do say, Nebuchadnezzar is going to bring it back. All that stuff he took, he's bringing it back. Bring it back within two years. <laughs> and Jeremiah says, no, no, that's not the story. Now, for those of you who haven't been with us in the past, I'll just do a little refresh. Jeremiah said, you're going into captivity for 70 years. Seven zero. That means your lifetime. You're going. You're going to be there for a while. Uh, but these people are saying, no, it's coming back in two years. So obviously they're going to be found out to be false prophets really quick because um, they may not even be fully in captivity yet when they're going to say, hey, two years is up. The artifacts are not coming back. We're not getting the gold. They're keeping it. And they look like they're threatening us. Um, oh, well, listen to the false prophets. Everything's going to be happy. We're God's people. We're in the promised land. We've got the temple. We've got all of his promises. Everything's hunky-dory, but not so fast. So Jeremiah told them clearly by the word of the Lord that these temple furnishings would not be coming back in their lifetime. He's already mentioned 70 years of captivity. And Jeremiah does say at the end of the 70 years, a nation will violently overthrow Babylon. How about that? I mean, he's not even going to be around to see it, but he's already talking about the overthrow of Babylon, even while he's telling the Babylonians, take us, we're yours, we're ready to go into captivity, we have it coming. 
Ah, but, oh yeah, by the way, God's people, in 70 years, Babylon's going to get violently overthrown. Not 69, not 68, 70 years, mark it. So it, it's just amazing, you know. And you would think that the Babylonians would be upset with him like Judah's upset with him and say, kill Jeremiah. He says in 70 years we're going down, but we're never going down because we're the greatest things in sliced bread. Or that the, uh, the nation of Israel and Jerusalem would say, kill Jeremiah because he says we're not coming back in two years and the artifacts aren't coming back and we're not going to have a return to the gold standard. <laughs> I had to get that in there because the gold artifacts, right? They're gone. And... Um, so, anyway, and it all happens. And in 70 years, the Medo-Persians are going to come. And God's going to write on the wall of the Babylonian Empire. I love to say these words, and I'm probably mispronouncing them. It's in Aramaic. Mini, mini, tickle you farsen. <laughs> okay, that's how I say it. It sounds like tickle you farsen. I don't know what a farsen is. But anyway. Me, me, tickle you, Farson, which means you've been weighed in the scales, Babylon. You've been found wanting. Uh, your time is up, and now your time of judgment is going to come. And it happens, and they don't think they can have it, but the Medo-Persians surprise them and come up through the aqueducts, which is really amazing. And how Jeremiah would have insight into all that is beyond me, except for the fact there's a living God who speaks to us and gives us dreams and speaks to us through his word and the principles thereof, and he could see what's happening with his people, but he also knows the promises of God for Israel. And uh, so that seems like a contradict. No, God's going to punish. He's going to chasten, but he's also going to keep his longer-term promises as well. So let's just turn to a passage here in 27 because I said we'd land on a verse here. It says in verse 9 of chapter 27, so do not listen to your prophets and your diviners and your dreamers and your fortune tellers and your sorcerers who are saying to you, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For that, my friends, is a lie. Okay, I, in, I inserted uh, a lie. They're prophesying to you a lie. Now we could preach a whole message on this, right? Fortune tellers, if you go to get your palm read, that's of the devil, don't do it. Uh, they're... they're they're acting like they have sources of knowledge. And they may have good hunches based on your body language or what kind of clothing you wear. In uh, magic, it's called a cold reading. You see sometimes in movies about Sherlock Holmes, and he could deduce things from the crime scene and from the way people were acting or what they were doing. You can do that sort of thing. But these people were professing to have powers to do such spiritual powers. So they were not only deceiving people, but they were self-deceived, and they weren't telling people this is entertainment. They were telling them, this is the real deal. And so they get self-deceived, and the brokenness of the demonic starts to get involved. You start playing with the Ouija board. You start playing with the astrology. And, oh, that's my sign. I'm just playing with it. But eventually, you know, you start depending on this stuff, and you won't travel. and think, it, it gets a hold on you, and you don't want to go there. You don't want to go to false divinations and occult practices like the ones listed in this verse. They're forbidden by God. Um, you know, you can consult the weatherman if you're going to the beach. You know, <laughs> consult the family. Is this a good day? <laughs> uh, see if the restaurants are going to be open. Uh, see if they've lifted their COVID restrictions. That's fine. Um, but uh, this other stuff, seeking fortune tellers, palm readers, uh, soothsayers, uh, talking with the dead, uh, talking with spirit guides that are supposedly angels. and But that was a good, they're not good angels because the Bible says don't do it. So if they're, you're getting communication, it's from a devil or a demon, and uh, you don't want to do that. Um, so anyway, we landed on that verse. Now we're in chapter 28. This is fun. This is, it's another drama, kind of like in 26. And uh, if I say it's fun, I'm trying to keep this light, but actually for Jeremiah, it's pretty intense. So here's what happens. There's a, there's a false prophet that shows up named Hananiah. And he prophesies in the name of the Lord, uh, Yahweh, uh, the king of Judah, that all the vessels will come back to the land in two years. And Jeremiah says in a sarcastic voice, well, amen. Amen, they're coming back. Now, how do you know it's a sarcastic voice when he says, amen, they're coming back in two years? Because he's already said in the previous chapter, they're not coming back in two years. They're coming back in 70 years. So this, this guy, he's up at the temple. He said, oh, no, 
like I said, Nebuchadnezzar took the gold artifacts and stuff, the gold standard, but it's all coming back, and everything's just going to be hunky-dory. So Jeremiah says, well, amen. Would that that would be so, but it's not going to be so. So Hananiah starts getting physical with Jeremiah. And we already know they wanted to kill him two chapters earlier. But what he does is Jeremiah apparently has an object lesson with him. I love object lessons. I wish I could have got my granddaughter's frog for faithfully relying on God or fully relying on God. But it wasn't to be. But object lessons are cool. I remember when Pastor Tom had a grasshopper up here once. He's not fond of grasshoppers, but when that grasshopper was here, I remember that just like it was yesterday. But so Jeremiah had an object lesson, and you might guess what it was based on the previous chapter. He had a wooden yoke, like what the oxen would wear, and he put that thing up on his shoulders, and he wore it, and he said, you might as well put the yoke on and go happily into captivity in Babylon because if you don't do it happily, you're going to meet with unparalleled violence. Um, so Hananiah takes Jeremiah's object lesson away from him. Give me that thing. Tries to wrestle away the, the yoke, and he gets it, and then he breaks it. And so this is not good. So then Jeremiah says to him, here's a word for you, Hananiah. Um, you broke a wooden oxen, and now the Lord says, um, you're going to go into captivity with an iron yoke. <laughs> it's good. It's going to be an iron one now um, because people like you and, and people of God who are not repenting are not listening uh, to the word of the Lord. And uh, he also prophesies that Hananiah will be dead within one year before the full siege of Babylon. And in less than one year, Hananiah, apparently in an untimely manner, fell dead just as the Lord through, spoke through Jeremiah. So... This Jeremiah, he's having some power encounters. You can break my yoke, but you can't break the word of God. It's true. It stands. If he says the judgment's coming and you mess around with the wooden one, the iron one's coming. And um, this is one of the things that Old Testament taught in the Torah and the law of Moses, that if you prophesy in the name of Yahweh and it doesn't come true or he didn't speak, uh, that's one of the signs you're not a true prophet from the Lord. Also things like if you tell people to consult with witches and mediums and spirits and the dead and all these other things they are doing, uh, these, are, these are signs of uh, punishable by death kinds of things. So when Hananiah tells him that the Lord impressed him that, uh, I mean, Jeremiah tells Hananiah that the Lord impressed him and he's going to be dead in a year, I'd, if I was Hananiah, I'd be looking around. I'd be taking my vitamins. Look, I'm taking my fish oil. Maybe I should go a little softer on the message. Okay, I won't break your yoke the next time. Bad yoke. Anyway, sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, but he's dead. He's dead in chapter 28, so that's the end of him. But let's take a look at some verses in 28, because I said we're not just going to do sports highlights but on uh, each chapter, but take a look at some of them. So in chapter 28, you see in the first verse, it's during the reign of Zedekiah, and it's the fourth year that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, from Gibeon spoke in the house of the Lord and he says I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon within two years all the vessels are coming back and Jeremiah you can see it down there in verse 6 says just as I said a sarcastic well amen <laughs> but that ain't gonna happen and then you can see down in verse 9 and 10 when the word of the, that prophet does not come to pass it will be known that the Lord has truly said when it does come to pass, it will be known that that prophet was truly sent from God. Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah, the prophet, and broke it. And down in verse 17, you'll see, and Hananiah died. So as I mentioned, we're doing a flyover, but that's basically what's happening in this chapter. You can see, uh, see where we're going. So that's the end of, of chapter um, 28. Now, we're into chapter 29, which is the chapter we're going to dwell on a little bit tonight in uh, more detail. But let me give you a quick, uh, quick overview of it. Jeremiah now sends a letter to some of the exiles that have already gone to Babylon because the Babylonian siege is on and it's in stages. They're already, they've already carried off the gold stuff from the temple. And as we know, it's not coming back. 70 years. 
But now Jeremiah, is, he's not only prophesied to the pagan nations and told them they should put on the yoke and go as well, but now he decides to send a letter to Babylon to the Jewish people that are already there captive. <laughs> this guy's got guts, don't you think? I mean, first he's prophesying to his own country about judgment. Then he's prophesying to pagan countries about judgment. And now he's, he's, and he's telling the people, just put on the yoke and go because it'll be better for you if you go than if you have to feel, uh, deal with the violence that's coming your way. And now he decides he's going to write a letter to the exiles that have already gone and uh, because he's concerned about them because they're getting some false news. And so what he tells them is build houses, live in them, take wives, work the land, multiply there, pray for Babylon, for in its welfare is your welfare, and do not be distracted by false prophets because you are going to be there for 70 years, for most of them their whole lives, and God's plans are actually for your good. And you will find God when you seek him with your whole heart, and you'll be gathered from all the nations. And those who do not go into captivity willingly are going to be a horrible fate. So he, in his letter to the exiles, he tells them this. <laughs> um, to the exiles who God sent away concerning two false prophets, and he names the false prophets by name, that are false prophets now. We already saw them in the pagan nations, right? And he rebukes them, and he rebukes the one that's there, the one that broke his yoke. And now he's rebuking the false prophets that are prophesying to the people of God in Babylon via this uh, letter. And so he names out two prophets by name who are giving them happy news of short captivity in Babylon. Um, and that is that those two false prophets are going to die at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar by getting roasted alive. Now, we always hear about, you know, the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, and I love that song we sing. There's another one in the fire standing next to me. There's another one in the water holding back the sea. But if you're a false prophet and you're there in Nebuchadnezzar's land, maybe even prophesying in the name of Marduk, the Babylonian uh, false gods, doesn't matter. That crazy... Nebuchadnezzar is going to fly off the handle and he's going to roast you. I don't know why, but it turns out he does. And so we know they've used the furnace before and they've used it effectively, which is kind of an interesting thing in the context of the three Hebrew children. It wouldn't probably have been something they had not heard about and hadn't been used effectively before. Uh, and he also tells them, oh, by the way, these two false prophets are also committing adultery with their neighbor's wives and uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to roast them in the fire. One's Shemaiah, the other false prophet, is said to have the name Zephaniah, uh, who claims to be a priest, and that may be the same one that put Jeremiah in shackles. And uh, Zephaniah had these, um, the complaint actually read in front of Jeremiah. And uh, No, actually Zephaniah was not the one that didn't put Jeremiah in shackles. <laughs> so he reads the letter from these false prophets, to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah gives them a word from the Lord that these false prophets are going to roast because they're making God's people believe a lie by prophesying in Yahweh's name. Now, <laughs> I don't want to give you specifics on this, but if you grew up in an evangelical church that taught the word of God and believed in the authority of the Bible and the new birth by a living hope by Jesus Christ, rising from the dead, you're a blessed person. Because it is true that an awful lot of churches today, Protestant and Catholic and Eastern Orthodox, have ministers that are actually kind of professional counselors that are, they wear the religious garb, but they pretty much tell people whatever the popular cultural things are. And um, because they're it's like Father Mulcahy in the old MASH series, you know. He's a harmless guy. He's there to kind of comfort the troops uh, in war, but nobody takes him seriously. He's just kind of a sentimental presence. That He's a good ear. He's a good listener and this kind of thing. So the trick with that kind of thing is it can lull you to sleep so that you don't really hear the word of God. You never hear Father Mulcahy or some of these churches preaching paragraph by paragraph through the book of Isaiah, or through the book of Leviticus, or through the book of Jeremiah, or even through the Gospel of John, for crying out loud. They'll take one verse, and then they'll tell, first they got a half an hour story to tell you, and then they, they read the verse, 
And then, so the moral of the story is be nice and go out and be nice. And uh, we're all nice, you're nice, I'm nice, we're all nice. And it's just, it's so benign, but it's actually cancerous because all of us are terminal because we have Adam's sin and we're all terminal because we've all sinned and the Bible teaches that the wages are sin and we need a substitute who's sinless that will die on a cross for us but not just die to forgive us but conquer death and the resurrection and pour out his spirit and change us from the inside out so that we can follow him with joy and happiness and gladness probably or joyfulness um, even while we're suffering persecution like Jeremiah does but they don't talk about that message and there's probably about 8 to 8.5 out of 10 churches are, are like this. Not all. I, I know half a dozen churches here in town I'd be happy to point out to you. Say, this is a word preaching church. Is maybe even more than that. Uh, so, several come to mind now. But if you actually made a list through the yellow pages and, and marked them all off, it's going to be about 10%. <laughs> and that's of people that are religious. So can false prophets come that help people believe lies um, and still have a collar on or a religious garb or a nice appearance like Father Mulcahy or like uh, somebody else, Mr. Rogers. By the way, I hear Mr. Rogers is pretty courageous on racial reconciliation. But yeah, there are people that are just nice people. You know, they're, they're safe, they got a nice sweater, they wear tennis shoes, they're cool, but they aren't necessarily a sheep. And that's why we have to measure things by the Word of God. So let's spend a little time here in Jeremiah. And take a look here, the word of God. Verse 1, these are the words of the letter Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs of the officials of Judah and Jerusalem and the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisha, the son of Shaphan, and uh, you know all these names, the importance of this is this is history. This, these are historical people. These are the the siege from Babylon happened in real history. This is not a made up story like Archie Archie, you know, the, the Noah filled he, the Archie Archie and filled it up with Ard Varky Varkies. You know, we have these stories and they numb us down. Noah was historical. The flood happened in real history. This happened in real history. So it's not only telling us that uh, Jeremiah sent the letter, but we may find that incredulous. Jeremiah, Judah is under siege. The Babylonians have surrounded you. They're going to kill you. How in the world would he get a letter out? Well, somehow maybe the Babylonians liked him because he was telling the people, surrender, put the yoke on and go. <laughs> so... Oh, you're sending out a letter? You're not sending out a letter. Oh, it's from Jeremiah? Go ahead, send the letter. So it goes, it tells all the people here that he's sending out the letter through. And it said, going into verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Interesting title. Yahweh, the, the God of the armies of heaven. <laughs> to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, whom I have sent into exile in Babylon, Yahweh says. He doesn't say, Babylon, the Babylons did it, or they tricked me. Uh, God says, well, this was it's my permissive will, but really, you know, I'm wringing my hands. I feel real bad that you're there. You're coming back in two years. They aren't. No, God says, I'm the one that sent you there. And so uh, listen up. And here's what it says there, just as I summarized earlier in verse 5. Build houses and live in them. You know, if you do that in the United States, it's uh, usually a 40-year mortgage, 40-year mortgage, and you might leave it to your kids, and they might have it for 30 years. That's 70 years. This is talking about permanence here. Per so build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Just a word about that. Be fruitful, even when you're suffering under paganism. You can be fruitful. God is with you. And uh, 
And it gets back to the creation, right? Didn't God say, be fruitful and multiply? And how? Through marriage. <laughs> not through polyandry, not through polygamy, and not through all the other things that you're doing, but uh, marriage, verse 7. And seek the welfare of the city that I have sent you into exile. Could I just take a pause there and say, excuse me, God, but this is Babylon. Remember Babylon from the old where uh, they tried to build this tower into heaven and they're stargazers and they're still stargazers and, and you punish them by scattering them and now they, they're brutalizing our family members back home and you're saying to seek their welfare? Whoa, that seems kind of crazy. But what did Jesus say about our relationship with our enemies? <laughs> this is why the Christian life is supernatural. He said we're supposed to pray for our enemies and pray for those that persecute us and actually rejoice because of it because they did the same thing to the prophets of old. Now that, my friends, <laughs> you want to talk about fake news, you want to talk about the left or the right, you want to talk about the green or the in-between, uh, this is supernatural. This is crazy. People are going to ask you for the reason for the hope you have if you do this. If you pray for those that are enemies politically or spiritually or economically or personally or physically towards you, <clears throat> excuse me, or towards your loved ones, that's going to be something. So he says in verse 7, Seek the welfare of the city I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And then it goes on to say, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Israel. They went into captivity in Assyria. Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to their dreams, what they dream. For it is a lie. They are prophesying to your name, but I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you realize this or not. It's kind of hard to say because we are whole people. We are body, soul, spirit. We are mind, will, and emotion. We are living souls in bodies that God says it's good. Even though it's breaking down and it's a product of the fall, we're supposed to treat the body good. Love yourself, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The verse is about marriage. No man hates his own body, but feeds it and nourishes it. And you should do the same for your spouse. So, um, I'm just speaking here holistically about what the Bible teaches uh, because a lot of times we think, oh, the, we don't need to worry about these other things and we certainly don't need to worry about cities and we certainly don't need to worry about countries and we certainly don't need to worry about the body and we certainly don't need to learn about economics and we certainly, this is no time for planting a garden. This is a time for grieving. We're going into captivity. This is no time to think about economic development and it's certainly not a time to think about getting married or kids. My kids just died back there. I've got one surviving kid and he's wounded spiritually and emotionally. I don't know what, but God says this. <laughs> And it's pretty amazing. If you're in captivity and you're hearing the false prophets saying you're all going home in two years, back to that good old Jewish kosher food and everything that you know and the same language that you're used to coming from, it's going to be a sweet old time. It would be very tempting to say, I'm going with the false prophets. I'm not reading that news source. I'm not watching that CNN thing. I'm, I'm watching this channel. Or, but... God said it through Jeremiah, and he's already vindicated Jeremiah through some deaths and through some other prophecies that have come true, and he wants them to, um, to be a witness in Babylon. Just a few more words about that. There are people that say this expression, maybe you've heard it before, a rising tide lifts all ships. Have you ever heard that expression? This is kind of common in the business world. Um, a rising tide lifts all the ships. And the point that they're trying to make is if you can strengthen an economy by having a decent business that's got integrity, um, 
then other people will want to invest in your business and other businesses are going to flourish too because they see it's a safe place. It's not going to get robbed or destroyed or the government won't come in and take the profits or gangsters won't come in and, and want protection. But if you, if you develop the thing and it actually flourishes, it attracts more flourishing. So just to give you an example, I, I remember when I was growing up, McDonald's was brand new. Yes, this tells you how old I am. And we would drive from my small farm town, Durand, Illinois, to Rockford, Illinois, 180,000 people. Durand had 600. I still managed to be at the bottom of my class. Uh, high school of 200, yes. Actually expelled several times when my father was president of the Board of Education. But anyway, I always had a summer job bailing hay. You know, they could use somebody like me. If you got a body, you're willing to sweat and throw the bales. Me. So we go into Rockford, and we go to McDonald's, and we would see how many hamburgers we can eat. And, you know, they're thin little things, man. You could eat like three or four or five of them, get some fries, get a chocolate milk. I'm making you hungry. Maybe not, because, you know, maybe McDonald's is not maybe, you know, the Golden Arches Supper Club for you. You know, I don't, but anyway. Um, but anyway. But then you'd have that McDonald's on the corner there of the street, and within a month or a couple of months, a Jerry's would show up on the other corner. You probably don't remember Jerry's, but Jerry's was just exactly like McDonald's, but it had a different name. It was called Jerry's. And even today, if you get a successful McDonald's on the corner, Wendy's is going to be there within six weeks. And Subway's going to be there in a little while, and down the road, Arby's is going to show up as well because it's the rising tide lifts all the ships. And this, that's all I can say about it. And it's just, so when God says, seek the welfare of the city that you're in, because in its welfare is your welfare, he's not talking about a welfare state. <laughs> he's just talking about your well-being. But he's not talking about their spiritual well-being. Their spiritual well-being is from a relationship with him and listening to the word of God and listening to the prophet Jeremiah and other prophets that he's going to raise up. Daniel, for instance. Ezekiel, and others are, are going to be coming down the pike. Um, but he is saying, seek the good of this city. How do you relate this to the teaching of Jesus? Especially when you know Revelation chapter 17 and 18, two full chapters, talk about the destruction of Mystery Babylon and that whore Babylon, and it's the city on the, on the hills, and it's got all that occultism, and it's still going to be judged. It's be the final judgment for Babylon. How do we make sense out of this. Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 talks about believers not only supposed to pray for their enemies, but to function as light in the world. Now, Jesus is the light of the world. We're not the light of the world, but we are image bearers. So we are to mirror Christ. We're to reflect him to this world, which means we reflect his light. And if people are in darkness, they're in paganism, they're in occult practices, they're in bondages of fear, or they have division, visions of grandeur, that they're undefeatable, that they're going to last forever. We turn on the light of truth. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Messiah is coming, and they, on him is going to be laid the, the sins of us all. And, and there is a true God, and, and, and the wages of sin are death. Uh, but he has grace and the promise of a redeemer. So we, we turn on the light, and he also says, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, you are the salt of the earth. Um, so what does that mean? You know, why should we be turning on the light in this world anyway? Should we just get out of here, you know? And, and salt, what does that mean? Does that mean we're supposed to assault people? No. <laughs> uh, what it means, salt was sprinkled on food to bring out its flavor that's already there the flavor that's already there. what is the flavor that's already there god's creative design god has created this world good but it's broken by the fall but when we eat and we participate in economic growth and when we encourage other people in the good ways to go according to god's creation plan it's like you're sprinkling salt on this and drawing out what god's original good intent was like for marriage for instance for this reason shall a man, not a boy, leave his father, not fathers, and mother, not mothers, and be united to his wife, not his wife's. And the two, in case you missed it, will be one flesh. Marriage is God's original plan. So you get this stuff 
from Scripture, God's creative order in, in the Torah, and you, you sprinkle salt on it. and say, this, this was actually good. This would, this would actually flourish our city. This would help us. This would help Babylon become a better place. Now, I know it's going to sound a little bit strange to you here, but in a way, this is what God actually does for Babylon because the brokenness that the people of God experience because of their sin and the horrific judgment that they experienced in a lot of ways and this whole cross-cultural getting taken to a country with a different language that you don't like and with customs and idolatry and everything else that you don't like awakens some of them. Not all, but some, a remnant. And we know some of the examples I already mentioned. Daniel in chapter 1. He has a witness to somebody who works for the king who is watching over the elitist exiles and he, he's trying to make them eat certain kinds of foods. And Daniel has a witness to this guy that's pretty diplomatic about, well, I don't want you to die if we look scrawny. Put it to the test and we'll see if our God comes through for us and God does come through for him and it turns out that they're actually wiser and stronger and it's a witness to this guy, right? And we see Daniel again having a witness to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to kill him, uh, but, but first he wants to kill all the occultists and all the people that he's training, uh, including the uh, Jewish people, because uh, they can't interpret his dream. Actually, not just interpret the dream, but actually tell him the dream and interpret the dream. But Daniel does it and saves the pagans' lives as well and has a witness to Nebuchadnezzar. Well, like most witnesses, it doesn't catch the first time. <laughs> You've got to have a witness a couple of different times. It's like, you know, it says somebody plants the seed and somebody waters and somebody else is involved in the reaping of the harvest. So we all have a part in this. You can read about that process in the last paragraphs of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the love of Christ compels us and uh, to be witnesses. And we know that Daniel has a witness to Belteshazzar, the king after Nebuchadnezzar. We know that he has a witness to, to the one when they wrote the meeny, meeny, tickly farson on the wall. <laughs> and, and we know he has a witness to the, the Persians because they're the ones that throw him in the, the lion's den because he was praying. They passed the law said, no praying. He's praying anyway. And now he's a witness to this culture as well, the culture that actually destroys Babylon in fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. So... What am I saying here? Our God is an awesome God. He is victor. He is true. His word is established. And you don't need to go to occultism. And you don't need to go to politics. And you don't need to say, oh my goodness, but I was raised this way. And you don't need to go to any special language. He is a global God who is the owner of this world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And yes, I do believe, as Pastor Thomas said, and we have said many times at Bible Prophecy Conferences, that many of the trajectories of the time that we live in are going towards globalism, they're going towards totalitarianism, they're going towards Antichrist, because that's predicted in the Scripture. But because of the witness of the church being light and salt in the world, it's not happened already. It could have happened. It could have happened with Henry Kissinger. I mean, I didn't say it with Henry Kissinger. But uh, traveling the world, the peace and bath, it could have happened with Adolf Hitler and Mussolini. Mussolini, the guy from Italy, he could have been the false prophet. Hitler could have been the Antichrist. Certainly he killed enough Jewish people. It could have happened in a lot of different times in history. I believe that he wants us living as though he can come at any moment. Not so that we won't seek the welfare of the city that we're in. Not so that we won't plant gardens. Not so we won't pray for those that persecute us but so that we're engaged in culture so we can tell people about Jesus. And he is so worthy to tell people about. Uh, people today, you know, COVID has made us all squirrely. We've been locked in and we're going a little bit nuts. And some of us, like me, that are more extroverted, we are wanting to come out of this COVID like a fire hose. And that fire hose has been kinked up and we are so ready to get out there and we want to get on the bridge and then we see a little house plant. I'm going to water that house plant with a fire hose. Shoots a clear across. So, you know, it's like, no, 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 Joe. <laughs> Go easy. Go slow. People are not as excited about this as you are. Uh, people have <laughs> different perspectives. Take it easy. Seek their welfare, not just your release 
Uh, so it's important for us to see words like this and think, how does it, could this apply to us today? And I think it's just this way. We actually do seek the welfare of our wayward children or cousins or relatives or people on the job that are cheats. We want what's good for them because God's creation design is good. And it will bring blessing to their life. And if they would follow it, um, they would find, yeah, they may go through persecution and suffering too. But in the long haul, not just for heaven, but even in terms of their character, it's for their good. And if they improve, that's going to be good for us too. Because we're in relationship with them. And we want to be in relationship with people that aren't edgy and evil and dangerous and <laughs> doing drugs and a risk to themselves, to everybody. So this seeking the good, it's, it's a big thing. Now, you'll see here in verse uh, 14 of chapter 29, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes. Isn't that interesting? So <laughs> let's go back to verse 10 of chapter 29. Thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's a wonderful verse. You've probably seen that verse on plaques, right? Uh, plaques like things you hang on your wall. It's a great thing. I've got one in my, in my office. Um, it's not hanging on the wall, but I've been thinking of somebody I could give it to. But um, anyway, but I've always kind of choked on this verse applying to the church because you see what the context is, right? People who are in exile who are probably going to die in exile, but their children, maybe if they raise them in the Lord and have a witness there in pagan Babylon and seek the welfare of the city and have a witness to these pagans, <laughs> um, they're going to come back to the land. God said they're coming back to the land. Not in two years, not with the vessels, not with the utensils, but they're coming back to the land. And uh, he says, I'm going to be found by you when you uh, seek me with your whole heart. Now, if you read the rest, rest of the chapter, you're going to see there's some false prophets that get really ticked with Jeremiah and say, don't listen to him. And um, basically, they fall into ruin as well. So... Uh, I would like to read a little bit of chapter 30 to you because um, it goes into a little bit more detail about the future promise for Israel. This is so cool. Um, so chapter 30, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you, for behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, declares the Lord, and I will bring them back to the land to take possession of it. Let's take a pause there just to think about this. God says, I'm going to restore Israel and Judah. Why doesn't he just say Judah? Jeremiah is witnessing in Judah. Jerusalem's the capital of Judah. Isn't Judah and Jerusalem enough? Didn't Israel go into the Syrian captivity where all the ten tribes were supposedly lost and, and intermarried and, and they're all vanished into the wind? There's no more Israel. The church is Israel. This, a lot of churches will tell you this. Um, or Jesus is Israel, so there's no need for any future Israel. Well, the reason there's a reason for a future Israel is because the Bible says he's going to bring Israel and Judah back into the land. I, 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 you don't have to read it in the Hebrew. You don't have to have a rocket science degree. You don't have to know. They just read the Bible. There it is. Israel and Judah, they're coming back. And God's going to establish them in the land. Do I believe the current gathering is that? Yes, I do. Why wouldn't I? It's Israel. <laughs> they're people, they're, Jew they're self-identified Jew Jewish people. They're back in the land. Have they repented and believed in Messiah Jesus? A number of them have, but not large enough of a group of them yet to be a catalyst for the kinds of things we see described at the end of Romans chapter 11, where it says all Israel will be saved and they'll be grafted back into the true vine. But things are happening. Things are happening like, this is being recorded on Facebook. 
other people were there reading Jewish people Isaiah 53 in Hebrew and asking them, who are they speaking about? And Jewish people are saying, well, that sounds like Yeshua to me. They say, well, guess what? It's here in the Bible, right? In the, these major prophets, you know, Jeremiah is going to prophesy about it later. Isaiah prophesies about it. And it's all over the place in Scripture. So the prophecies are going to happen. And Jesus is eventually going to reign on this earth. Now, I, again, for all those churches I told you about, <laughs> they're not going to tell you this. They're not going to tell you. And it's odd, too, because they always pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But they must not think that the Lord is ever going to answer that prayer. That his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And not just in pockets of revival here before the, the rapture or but the believing saints during the tribulation. You have a little pocket of hopeful believers that are gathering or something like that. It's, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and he's going to get his property back. And it's called the Millennial Kingdom. It takes place at the end of the seven-year tribulation when Jesus Christ comes back, not for his church, but comes back at Armageddon to slay the armies of the world that are coming against, you guessed it, Israel and their hateful, demonic anti-Semitism. And he's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to reign on this earth. And the earth is going to be restored. And the promise you read about him in, in the, the major prophets, it's wonderful. I mean, the, the, there's no more curse on the property. Uh, people live extremely long lives, and, and, and the children are playing on a mountain with a poisonous snake and putting their hand in there, and nothing bad happens to them. It's, the Bible uses this concept of shalom to not just talk about my personal peace to get over my kinky, weird anxieties caused by COVID or my sin or the devil or whatever else. Uh, and I'm glad. I'm glad for peace that passes understanding from my own personal experience. But when the Bible talks about shalom, it's talking about everything. It's talking about getting back to Genesis, uh, back to Genesis 2 and 1 in his created order. And you actually see it's described in Revelation in the last two chapters of the Bible. It talks about the tree of life shows up again. And the tree of life has got fruit that's bearing fruit all the time. And it's for healing of the nations. What does that mean? That's not heaven. Because in heaven, I think we don't have any more sin or sickness or grief. I think it's talking about the millennial kingdom and the reign of Christ on this earth. Um, do I understand all that fully? Do I understand what that means? No, I don't. And for me personally, when I die, do I believe I'm waiting somewhere to go into paradise earth with, with this perfect utopia and yet still long life but not eternal life? What's that mean? That seems good. Yeah, for me, man, when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord in a new body, and I am going to live forever with the Lord. I call that heaven. The Bible calls that heaven. Uh, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, he called it paradise. It can be called eternal life. It can be called a lot of different things. But when you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of sin, and you stop trying to control your own life, your own way, and you say, Lord, take me take my business, take my work, take my wife, take my children, take my desires, take my hobbies, and use them for your glory. They just say, I'm all in for you, Lord Jesus. Then he adopts you in his family, and he, you're a new creation, and guess what? Eternal life has already begun for you. It's already begun. You're indestructible like Jeremiah. Jesus said you'll never die. Now, he did talk about believers who sleep. <laughs> some, some believers in the first century were persecuted to death but he refers that to resting in the Lord in the Old Testament it's talked about a place called a place of torments for the rich man and Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom there, there's this sense that the Bible's consistent theme is this when you die if you're a believer you go immediately into God's presence in shalom and you'll have a new body. Not the new body you're going to get at the rapture, but some kind of body you're going to be recognizable in. Um, the martyrs in Revelation chapter 4, 11, who cry out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you fail to avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth? They're known. They speak. They commune with God. They're in God's 
presence, and they're known to be martyrs. Something about their former life is recognizable. Uh, and when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, somehow the prophets that didn't, uh, the 12 disciples who didn't have snapshots of, of Moses and Elijah recognized, that's Moses, that's Elijah. They're there in some kind of body that they're able to see. And it's just amazing to me. It's amazing to me just how much we don't realize how in God's sovereignty we are indestructible until our time's up. Now, I'm not saying that to so do stupid things that would be outside of God's will, like try to walk in front of traffic or something. That would be wrong. God wouldn't lead you to do that anyway. But I'm just saying, you think about your witness. Think about your witness to a Muslim international student or you're overseas, a, a, a Muslim radical extremist, or uh, you're in a situation where you're witnessing to somebody that's um, a sexual lifestyle activist that has regalia and bumper stickers and T-shirts that say they hate you. And you say, Jesus loves you, and I love you too. And you think, oh, they're going to kill me. Uh, but you know what? You're indestructible until your time's up. It's just, it's just that simple. Same with Jeremiah, same with the exiles, same with Jesus, same with that dying thief on the cross, same with our lives as we wait for Jesus' return. And what a glorious return it's going to be. And it will, there will be a global shalom on this earth, and there will also be communion with God in heaven. There's already communion with God in heaven. Our loved ones are in his presence right now. They are more alive than we are if they know the Lord. They're more alive than we are. My best friend, Kevin Johnson, is with the Lord. He's been there for 10 years. He is more alive than I am. I think about it. I don't talk to him because we're not supposed to talk to the dead. And he doesn't talk to me either. As if he did, I'd rebuke it because it would be a demon. But <laughs> Because God doesn't allow that kind of thing to happen. But what I'm just saying is they are more alive than we are, and we are looking forward to being with the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. The Bible tells us, Comfort one another with the thought of the rapture. Um, even Jesus speaks about martyrdom as a, a privilege, which is really wild because there's one sense in which we're all martyrs because we die to self. <laughs> and, and we're all, as I already mentioned, terminal. So that, that's a done deal. Um, and I'm pro-martyrdom, okay? Uh, if you're hearing this on Facebook, don't take me too literally on this because you've got to hear the second part. I'm pro-martyrdom. I would not mind being a martyr for the Lord. That's different than a radical, crazy person that kills people. I, that just means I, I'm willing to die for the Lord. What I, what I really I, what I get real nervous about, though, is pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we, if we could just kill me quickly, you know. You ever see the movie, What About Bob? He, it's uh, Bob Wiley he drives his psychiatrist crazy. It's a humorous thing with uh, Bill Murray. And he says, he gets on a bus and he's afraid to travel on buses. So he says to the person sitting next to me, can you just hit me, just hit me right here real hard. He wants to get knocked out. <laughs> it he would just happen quick. B.A. Baracus in the A-Team. Remember that? He was afraid to fly in airplanes. Just, just knock me out. We're going to go travel and you're going to have to knock me out. There, there are certain things that, yeah, I'll admit it. I'm a... Uh, I'm not fond of, and this is why I don't like dentists. Sorry, Jim, and other dentist friends. Uh, I just don't like, I know Novocaine works thrills, but I don't like, I don't like anything that sounds or smells like it's going to be painful. <laughs> but God is able to take crazy people like me and like you and walk us through that valley of the shadow. Isn't that what Psalm 23 says? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear for my... Your right hand is there, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You've been feeding me, even in the presence of my enemies. You're anointing my head with oil. I'm a blessed man, living in a fallen world. But with you folks and fellowship, what a privilege, what a pleasure. And Jeremiah, what a prophet, what a prophet, huh? Why don't we stand and, and pray together as we uh, close our time this evening. If you want to stand up, you can. If you want to stay seated, you can stay seated too. Father God, we thank you for your word that it is alive and living and true and vindicated in Jeremiah's day, in Babylon's day, in Medo-Persia's day, in the Roman Empire's day, in the subsequent days of 
the Enlightenment, during the Reformation, <laughs> during uh, the Great Awakenings in our country's history, in uh, South Sahara, Africa, in Asia. The gospel is going forward in uh, Central and Latin America. All nations are hearing the good news of Jesus. Yes, people are also hardening, and the wheat is getting more wheatier, and the tares seem to be getting more tarish. But Lord, you are sovereign, and you have called us to have a part in your harvest and in your your fields and in witness and seeking the good of the, the city that we are in until you come. And Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit because praying for enemies, praying even for people that are mildly irritating to us does not come easy for us. And we need to be refilled with your Holy Spirit. So tonight we ask that you would refill us corporately, and individually as well. And with every eye closed and every head bowed and as you're thinking about these things and the goodness of the Lord, if you're here tonight and you have never submitted your life to Jesus' Lordship, body, soul, and spirit, his will for your life, in your business, in your work, in your family, in your relationships, and you would like to submit your life to Jesus Christ tonight, uh, I'm going to ask you, just indicate you're in that condition by just raising your hand. Then after you raise your hand, I'm going to see it. And I'll wait for you, and I'll look for you here after the service and pray for you that you will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. So that's basically the, the routine here. So I'm asking you all right now as a congregation, if there's anyone here that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ and, and needs to, I'm not talking about getting refilled with the Holy Spirit. We can all ask for that today. We already have. But if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, and you know you need to, just slip up your hand. I'll see it, and I'll look for you to pray for you. Okay. I'm assuming everyone here is a believer, but I am still looking. So while I'm praying with my eyes closed, looking to see if the Lord by his Holy Spirit tugs on your heart and you're going to slip up your hand in a surprise, uh, I'm going to close this with prayer. Father, we thank you for this facility. We thank you for Father's Day. We thank you that you're a loving Heavenly Father who is righteous, true, and just. And we thank you that the earth is yours and you're getting your property back. We thank you that there's no Savior in this world that conquers death but Jesus Christ, and he is Lord. We're already confessing you to the glory of God the Father. We know every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess. But just like Jeremiah said, go willingly. Uh, and we want to be used by you as your servants, Lord. Gladly we bow the knee. Gladly we want to serve you and be a witness for you. If it's in Babylon, if it's in Lafayette, if it's in Indiana, or if it's even in that crazy Attica, we just, <laughs> we just raise up our partner churches, and we love you tonight because you first loved us. Thank you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.